Hello and welcome to Face to Face. This is on YouTube. This is a channel where we bring you the uh, session known as Face to Face on CD TV, where we do a one-on-one -on -one interview analyzing the big stories of the day or the, talking to the big personalities who are in the news. My name is Umar Sandamadu. Amadou. My guest today is the, he used to be called Embattled, then he was controversial, then now he's just Member of Parliament for Asin North, James Jachi Kwesin. You want to enjoy, stay around, enjoy this conversation. Uh, subscribe to the link and share it with your followers on YouTube. Now, when Parliament organized return the verdict after the 2020 general election, Parliament was a hung one. In fact, the NDC claimed it had majority, the MPP claimed same. It means that every seat mattered. So for January 6, before the House is convened and the clerk introduces the business of the day, there was importance that every side has their member in the chamber. One of them, the member of parliament for Asin North, was a subject of controversy even before the voting for a speaker and the continuous issues in the House of Parliament. His name, James Jachi Kwesin. He has gone to battle and he's back to Parliament. You're welcome to Face to Face. Thank you, Imaru. How are you doing? I'm very well. I'm very well. Thank you. How, how is the stress? You've had to conduct elections twice or go for elections twice in the last three years. Well, uh, ideally, I don't call it stress. Uh, the way I perceive things in life, uh, it's, a, it's a journey. Mm. It's a journey. And uh, even though there's uh, a lot of issues surrounding it, I was very confident that uh, I was going to achieve the purpose. I see. Before I came. I'm a journalist. What's your profession? Uh, professionally, I'm a social services administrator. A position I've held back in Toronto, Canada for the past. I did that for almost 20 plus years. Okay. Uh, until my retirement and my journey back to my homeland. So you were in Toronto? Yes. Did you maybe or maybe were you born there or you emigrated there? You were working there? No, no, I mean, no. of course. I'm sure by this time uh, you know the history surrounding my my origin. Uh, I was born in Asim Breku. Mm -hmm. uh, my both parents are from that district. Uh, my dad is from Asin Central, and my mom is from Asin North. So you went for Obimanzo to go and look for something small. Oh, no, so it was education. Oh, I, went, I went there at a very uh, tender, I mean, I would say at my youth. Okay. In my 20s. Okay. So I lived there for 40 years plus. Oh, wow. Did all my, after my secondary school at Infantsman, I made a journey to, uh, I was admitted to a college and then pursued my university education and obviously uh, I got into family situation and settled. So you married there or you married here? I married there. So your wife is from Ghana? Yes. Your children? Yeah. But you hold, so you held a citizenship of Canada in addition to the citizenship of Ghana? I've always been a Ghanaian as well as Canadian from that time. Okay, yes. so that, of course, because you were working there, um, it's logical, you had the citizenship and all of that. When did you decide to come back to Ghana to do politics? Well, this, this idea of uh, coming back to the homeland to uh, assist my community, or at least to engage with them, it started sometime in 2016. Um, intermittently, I was, uh, my parents were visiting, my mom and dad, and my last time my mother visited uh, was 2008, sorry, back, uh, 2004. Uh, As in visited, she came to Toronto? She came to Canada okay. to spend time with the rest of the family, and uh, she was there for four years straight. Okay. Just before she was leaving to come back, that was 2008. She had a one-on-one -on -one discussion with me, just maybe as she was doing it now, and said uh, she really uh, appreciate all the effort that I put in in life there. And, but she's going to ask me one thing, to turn my mind back home come and see the condition of life of the people there. Don't forget, she was a queen mother in Asim Breku. So she's held that kind of uh, role of uh, leadership position there. 
So it's always on her heart to see the well-being of the people. So when she said that to me, and also I'm a royal, and I said, uh, based on the fact that your mother is a queen mother, yeah. I can be a king or yeah. chief, and I said, break myself. So when she mentioned that to me, I started to think about it. And even prior to that, I had a, a very close uh, relationship with uh, our late president, uh, Professor Mills. Professor Mills, yeah. okay. Professor Mills uh, came to Toronto back in 2011, barely a year before he passed away. And we organized the NDC chapter there to have a meeting with him. He was very close friends to one of my uncles. And so during his swearing in that time, I had come to Ghana to witness it and to offer some uh, moral support. So in that sense, we had a similar conversation. And this is even before my mother's, uh, no, actually after, after. my mother's. Mm. So uh, one thing <laughs> Prof said was, uh, he calls me Junior. Because my dad bears the same name as mine, okay. James Jackson. Okay. He said, Junior, you should all, all people like you should come, and I'm quoting him. He spoke funny? Yeah. How did he say it? I said, Chris, Junior, one more if you know more boy. Now, he opened and said, What's he in your crutch for? Now, once one more no more boy. Now, what's he in your veranda boy? He said, That's exactly what he said. So, to wit, um, NDC are not a crutch for. Yeah. So you should come home and show to them that we have, yeah, we'll be well, uh, we'll, manage, we know, have more people ab abroad like that. who yeah. can also do the work. Exactly. I see. So you know, I mean, that was in person, and at uh, that time, to the ambassador, the Texan uh, ambassador, Texan was mm -hmm. the one in, uh, representing Ghana in, in Canada. Canada. He was also an old schoolmate uh, and fans him. So we were very close friends. So three of us were having a dinner engagement, and this conversation uh, transpired. Um, of course, when he passed away, I came to the funeral as well. So with my journey back home, I said, uh, so 2016, I so gave it a tour. Before 2016, so prior to this, were you actively involved in NDC politics over there? Oh, yes, yes. Okay. I was the vice chairman there. Okay. Yeah. Of, we, there we call it chapter. Of Canada or Toronto chapter? Uh, we had Toronto chapter. Okay. Yeah, Toronto chapter is one of the, the biggest, I would say. Okay. And then, uh, but our chairperson was in Montreal. I see. At the time. Yeah. Okay. And then you, 2016 came. 2016 came. Before 2016, maybe 2015, there about. Yeah, yeah. Tw you know, we started giving the thoughts and... So 2016 came, and I was invited by the chiefs and elders in Breco to come and, uh, and try to uh, help with the, uh, take over the seat and see about development, which I've been talking to them about all the time. Uh, I think as a part missing in 2010, okay. after my mom came to Canada and left in 08, she left the last time was May 08, she came back. My dad had also joined her uh, in 2006. Mom came 04, dad joined in 06, and they both returned in 08. Uh, fortunately, 2010, my mom passed. Sorry. So, uh, if I dad started giving me that inner thought about what she had discussed with me, so at the funeral that time, uh, it was just at the end of 2010 December, when 28 December precisely when she passed away. So we came back uh, with the family, uh, and they didn't have any proper uh, grounds for hold the funeral. I mean, in their own standard it was okay, but looking at the number of people that were coming. We had to uh, find ways and means, and so we did that at the school park. And I told the chiefs and elders. When one of these time permits, I'll come in and try to see the best I can do to develop a place for them. So then I went ahead and built a community center for them on my own in 2012. This is after my mom's uh, funeral. And so 2016, now uh, when I was invited to come down, I came, and the NDC party decided to go for me to go on a post. You went no, on no, a post. Sorry, not on a post. There was the primaries where. It was open. So at that time, we even had a, an NDC member of parliament. Uh, the elders and everybody encouraged me to uh, move on with it. But anyways, at the end of it, we lost the primaries. So you contested the primaries of 2016 and lost? Yes. At the time, 
Were you still a, Ghan a Canadian citizen? Yes, I was. You hadn't renounced? No, because what? the party didn't require that. Okay, so for I the internal primary. I, consul I consulted with them and they said okay. it wasn't necessary okay. until... Uh, you know, when you're selected, of course, there's a process that you have to take. So you def you left 2016. You went back to Canada. I went back. Went back. Then 2020. Continue with my employment and everything. In 2020, 2019, I came back because in 2016 election mm -hmm. we lost the seat. Yeah. I said no, it's a very swing seat. We lost the seat to NPP. I think that was a time when there was a sweep of NPP. You know, MPs uh, taking over. And um, so I came now 2019, it was clear that uh, I should not be contested. And so I, they offered me to go on a post. So the party decided you should go on a post? The party, the constituent, the secretaries and everybody, chiefs, elders, everybody were put their thoughts put their together. And no one raised the issue of your citizenship at the time? No. Okay. So the same process, right? I went to the veteran and everything. So then after, right after, this was conducted, I think, uh, very end of July 2019. Mm -hmm. So I left, I remember leaving August 1st and arriving in Toronto August 2nd. So the December 2019, because I'd already checked to know that it takes a roughly six months. At the highest level, nine months. It tells you precisely. To renounce your yeah, certificate. To get the certificate itself. Okay. But to renounce... You, you just apply. You just apply. Once you apply, you have your receipt. Your renunciation so you won the effect. primaries before you went to trigger the renunciation process. That's right. So you did that in August of 2019 or? December 2019. When you returned. Yes. So you filed the papers. I filed the papers. I chose the very date my mom had passed, anniversary date 28, to file the papers. In December. In December. Hoping that in the next and nine was, months uh, six to nine months so yeah. by between june may may and august the latest you should be receiving the certificate itself okay. and at the time you were not doing my try my query my try my query in ghana means i'll try and see whether i win the seat before i renounce no, or not no, no, you no. were certain you wanted to mm, renounce yeah. well, i was certain i was ready to return home um, were you renouncing because you want to run for parliament or you thought you needed to come back to ghana wh whatever may have been? well that was uh Coming back to Ghana was not necessarily a requirement to renounce. You know, you could, you could be a citizen and live yeah. anywhere. But okay. ideally, the rules and the regulations bounding you to become a member of parliament is some, something that I had already researched. And also the party had advised mm. that everything should be intact by August. Okay. So that's why I chose that date. So when you put in the application, did you have to be doing a follow-up? Or you just forgot about it and went about your business? No, once you apply, you see, it's a one-way decision. Filing for nomination, I mean, sorry, renunciation of your status in Canada, it's not as if you're applying for visa. Visa, you could be approved or denied, right? But I own the citizenship, and I, I, I declare and it form up. that I no longer want to own that. In fact, they even require you to supply the reasons why you want to renounce. And also require you to have a valid passport of a country that you're going to be a citizen of. So you don't because become a stranded you can, person? You cannot be stateless. Okay. That means then you can't move. Yeah. So I had to get my valid Ghanaian passport, which I've already had one. Oh. Let's, let's go back briefly. Even before that renunciation, I've always had dual citizenship certificate okay. of both Ghana and Canada. And you already had a Ghanaian passport? And I already had a Ghanaian passport, okay. a valid one. Now, so when you put in this application, how frequently were you checking if they would give you the certificate? Or you knew that it would be between six and nine months? So no, it would it's, come? It's, uh, it's absolutely six to nine months. Okay. It doesn't go beyond that. So when did it come? It came in... Uh, November. So that's beyond the nine months? Way beyond the nine months. And did they give you any explanation? Um, even before that, I was constantly checking. After it exceeded the nine months, which was August, I started July actually. I started chasing with my lawyers in Canada to find out why the delay. Apparently, because of the COVID at the time, all administrative institutions were shut. And uh, I'm sure it was global. It wasn't just Canada. 
So it was until they resumed work that they start working on all these applications. So your certificate came in November? November. And it was dated November? It was dated November. Okay. By which time you had already gone for the Electoral Commission's vetting, or yeah. you had not? No, we, the nomination you made. Yes, the nomination. Yeah. I had filed the nomination in October. October. So a month before then. A month then. before. Did the Electoral Commission guys ask you, either written form or through an oral interview, about your citizenship and the certificate that you ought to produce? Do you remember? Um, I recall that on the application itself, the nomination form, where there's a question of if you are a Ghanaian, uh, a citizen of this country. And of course, I check yes. In my mind, too, there's no section indicating otherwise. So it's either you are or you're not. And I know I am by birth, by my renunciation, because I acquired another citizenship of another country. So obviously, there, and, and I've done the renunciation application already. You see, uh, even according to my lawyer in Canada, when I was putting pressure on her sometime in July, August, he says, James, you don't have to worry about it because once you submitted the application, you pay the fee, the receipt is there. It's enough proof by court of law to show that you have taken the process to do it. They ask you the reasons why you want to renounce. I even got a letter from my constituency uh, chairperson to let the administrative process there know that it's because of X, Y, Z reasons that I'm running for an office and that requires me to renounce it. All that is part of my application to run. So in the paper you take that you were a Ghanaian, um, was there any vetting by the Electoral Commission where you had to meet a panel to talk about this? Yeah, we went to the, um, I think the, you go through the, they review the paper mm -hmm. with you. The nomination papers. The nomination papers at your district, local district uh, office, yeah. EC office. And that's what we went through. And then after that. That issue came up? No. They didn't ask they you didn't about it. No. So they cleared you to run? They cleared me to run. But at this time, you still knew that there could be a problem? No. You didn't, you were not. I didn't foresee that to be You didn't problem. have any no. doubts about no. what was happening? No. You were certain? I was certain. No one. Because I attached a copy of the application itself. To the Electoral Commission's yes, papers? it was always part of my, uh, I attached a copy to show that I have renounced the status. And during the campaign, no one raised that issue, not the NPP, not the NDC, that, hey, this guy is a dual citizen, we should be careful. Yeah. What happened was, uh, I think it was about two weeks to the time, uh, December 7th, sometime November 20th or thereabout, or 21st, uh, I got a notification from the EC local office that uh, they wanted to see me. So I proceeded to go to see the director there. And she said she had a letter for me from the EC headquarters. So in the letter it stated that uh, some concerned youth as group in Asin North are challenging my validity to run because they suspect or they, they know that I have a dual citizenship. So I said, fine. So I, I call uh, the signatory to the letter was one Dr. Serbo. Serbo Kwaku. Kwaku. Never met him before. So I said, uh, I have this letter and I'm required to see you. He says, when can you come to Accra? I think the time we're having this conversation was about the 25th of November. The letter had deadline of 28 to see him. So the 25th, this was on my campaign trail, uh, working my way out through the communities. And I, I called and he said, okay, then let's meet the 27th. So you came to Accra 27th? My brother, one of my brothers was visiting from Canada. We both, you know, he was with me, uh, supporting me through the campaign, Gabriel, we all. So the 27th, we scheduled, we planned that we come into Accra in the morning to see him. 
26th, I was coming from my campaign again. And my email on my phone, I saw a copy of the certificate that my lawyer had sent that he just received it that day. So I took the, I didn't even print it. I just carried my phone with me, of course. And uh, during the conversation, I said, oh, so what documents do you have for me? I have your file here. So I showed him, I said, I guess receive an email. It's was Serbo. Serbo himself. I said, there's an email here showing that uh, I have received a certificate. In his own word, he didn't attach any seriousness. He said, well, I've seen the application of renunciation on your file, but uh, you can go down and make a copy for me and go to my, uh, he directed me actually, I didn't know my way around there, directed me to a commission of oath to authenticate the copy. Now we came back up and gave it to him. We had our own social conversation. Uh, some I may not want to share, but... <laughs> yeah, don't worry, unless this was a biscuit and a tea drinking. <laughs> so uh, he there. said, you know, good luck with your campaign. I, if we need you, we'll let you know. But I don't think we will need you. This was Shribo Pakusa. This is his, on his own words. And you left. So we left. My brother and I left. This is Face to Face on City TV. We are telling the James Jachi Christian story through the horse's own mouth. Except that he's not a horse. He's telling us his story for the <laughs> first time, opening up about the details into the elections. When we come back, January 6, 2021, what happened? Was that the beginning of trouble for him or was it a continuation of more trouble? Please stay with us. City TV is live on DSTV. Find us on channel 363. On Go TV, we're on channel 117. And on HD Plus, get us on channel 108. On a digital TV, run a new search. But take note that without an antenna, you cannot access City TV. City TV can be accessed on any free-to-air digital box like the Go TV and HD Plus boxes. City TV, it's your world. Welcome back. This is Face to Face on City TV. My name is Omar Sanda Amadou. I'm a journalist uh, with City TV. My guest is a former MP and a current MP for Asin North. And he got all of this within just three years. James Chachi Kwesin. So you had a conversation with Shribo Kwaku. You said, go and do your business. And you went and you won the election. And I won the election. December 7. December 7. When, where were you declared? At the, I'm sure at the coalition center? Oh, yes. They declared they you. Declared the electoral me. commission the electoral held commission your hand. Held my hand. We came, uh, you know, and said that this is a victorious guy. Did you do a victory party? We did. They poured powder on you. Uh, you I know? think so, yeah. They, they shed some powder on you. <laughs> you had some party <laughs> yes, and all of those yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. So that was December 7th. December 7th. A month before the swearing in. Mm -hmm. Between that period, what happened? Between the December 7th and January 6th? Well, uh, uh, basically, there was nothing. No one brought any action, no, nothing. No, no action, no nothing. Sure there was an application. I, it, was, uh, it was towards the end, I think the third week, mm -hmm. thereabout. It was an application that. Uh, how, how convincing was your victory? Do you remember the vote difference? About 3,000 plus. Okay. Did your opponent call you to concede defeat? No. He didn't. No. Did he complain that he was cheated? No, she it, didn't. It's it, a she. It was a she. Okay, yeah, that's the same lady. Okay. She didn't complain. Then in the third week, what happened to you? What did you hear? Well, you see, the, the thing is, uh, I didn't foresee any of such things coming. Even though there was that action taken at the, uh, as I said to you, the petition. By the youth that uh, rose? Yeah. I thought that was the end. Did you of meet it. those youth? Never, members. never. I think okay. the way I was later told the, the youth name was just used as a. Because I was very much affected with the youth. Okay. So somebody thought wise that was if we use the youth, then we, they would okay. say, after all, the youth that's not on the side. Right? Okay. But my winner, actually, 2020, came because of the youth. Okay, they supported you. They strongly supported me. Okay. I came in, I started a youth wing, and uh, I enrolled about 4,500 of them. I see. So in the third week, what happened? Were you served within a court injunction? In the third week, there about... It was served, actually was served on to my lawyers, you know. And they, they said what, that you were not validly elected? Yes, and okay. that uh, they were challenging 
uh, my elections. And so they will put an injunction. Yeah, it will serve as an injunction for mine. And so they wanted to injunct mine. Um, they arranged that in court. It was a quick, a quick uh, action. I don't think we did. And you know that same entire process. Never had a day in court myself. Never had a chance. The trial judge never called uh, yeah, as a witness or anything, or even once, which my lawyers were demanding. Mm -hmm. it, could, it could be ex parte, so maybe. Yeah. Maybe so anyway, so. So the motion was moved, and the high court the judge agreed. Agreed with them. With them. Which means you should not go to parliament. You should not go to parliament. That was a decision. Was it served on you? Was it given to you? Well, you see, in all this process, I wasn't. I wasn't even aware. I wasn't in court. So, they gave so it to obviously, you. they 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 gave it to bailiff to serve. To serve. Yeah. And the bailiff didn't. Find and that it. was the the day before the swearing. Okay. So you never received it. Never received. Your it. Your lawyers didn't receive Nobody it. Nobody received it. Okay. January six is a night that MPs who have been elected come to elect a speaker and then get sworn in. That's right. I was told you were smuggled into the chamber. Uh, now that it has happened already and gone, do you want to share that story? Oh, no. I mean, when you say smuggled, it's like going through some, um, uh, what, security barriers or yeah. something? No. Um, I think if anybody did mention, uh, I won't use the word smuggled. I came in a team of my members. We were housed in a hotel together, right? and overnight and so we decided that we'll come together uh, it, 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 it was partly a celebration I, I was here covering the event that yeah. night that and night, i saw yeah. the ndc mps arrive in a bus yes wearing white well you were not part of that group yes. there, were, there were over a hundred of them who walked into the chamber mm -hmm. you were not part of that group no so which group were you in I was in a group, of a, in a smaller group. A smaller group. Yeah. Why did you have to do that? Was someone looking for you to arrest you that night? I, I had no idea. Uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say to arrest or... Were you dodging uh, anybody? In my mind? Yeah. No, obviously not. You're no, not dodging no, no, anybody. No, no, no. You're I, not thinking you remember, of a show up somewhere. No, Umar, remember that this entire process is new to, I would say, uh, we had about, what, 38 new members? Yeah. It was new to us, mm -hmm. and there's no such there was there was no such thing like a rehearsal. So I was just going with the flow, right? And you wore your white. I we were, were told to wear white. I wear white, like everyone else. And uh, people were designated or assigned to groups that to move along with. So I was given. I was assigned to a, a smaller group to come into the chamber. Did any person? security person or otherwise try to stop you from entering the chamber? No, no, Nobody no, stopped you. No. When you entered and took your seat, did anyone try to approach you from that seat? Well, it was during the process where they were talking, about, as you said, there was a controversy about this injunction and he, he was served and he wasn't served and the clerk tried to, uh, I guess, uh, hold a view that he, he received the service and we challenged the time he received the service, and finally he gave up and said it was, he didn't actually receive it. And so the bottom line is nothing was saved on me. Were you scared that this could lead to a problem for you, that there's an injunction that says don't sit in the chamber, but you were sitting there? No. You didn't never, panic at all? It never crossed my mind at all. So for you, you were just in the floor. You were just yeah, celebrating. Yeah, I, I was there. I was happy like everyone else. And you got sworn in. It was surprising to me that uh, my, my name came up as a controversy from the other side. Mm. Uh, first thing I heard is someone is not supposed to be here and he's here. An alien. Yeah, and I'm wondering who the person is. Then it <laughs> ended up is me. <laughs> so <laughs> I said, I can't believe this. Yeah. Well, what have I done wrong? You had become a celebrity overnight. You know? well, and that was the beginning of trouble for you. Oh, well, yeah, I think uh, on their side, yes. So when was the first, first time you, you appeared in court, even having been elected now, been sworn in, you've been going to parliament all right. At what point did you have to start going to court to answer questions on all these issues that have been brought against you? Oh, in the very same month, uh, January, after so January, January, so yeah. Um, the, the only thing is that uh, with that uh, case, 
more or less, uh, I think it considered a civil case. Right? Mm. I was not uh, required to required to be in the courthouse. Yeah, yeah. So my lawyers were attending most of the proceedings. Uh, intermittently, once in a while, I'll go myself to just to be familiar with what the process is all about. And how? Well, you, let me hold on to the legal matters. How were you doing your work as a legislator? You were a member of parliament. Your job is to help make laws. Were you able to do that? Because parliament was a new thing to you. Were you able to learn the ropes, yeah. know what to do? Oh, yeah. The first year, uh, as I said, uh, when the mother was still with the lower courts, uh, with the Cape Coast High Court, uh, that, that went on for almost six months uh, there about until uh, July or June, July 2021 when they had their ruling, right? So for the first six months, as I said, my lawyers were appearing most of the time. I was functioning, I was functioning normal. In you see, the thing is, uh, until you've been, in, you've been in to, through and through with my thoughts, and maybe my uh, experience does not shadow or cast any, any, uh, what would I say? Doubts. Well, you could say doubt, but I never harbored anything that I've done anything wrong up till today. I still think I did what is required of me. And I also came with a vision to help promote the development of my community. How were you able to do that over that period? Well, I was still fine. Like I said, I, my focus was there. Do you were you able to go weekends to the constituency for weekends, instance? Weekends, all functions. Were you able to get some projects there for that? I was working on projects. What's some, what are some of the projects that you for got there? For the at? first six months, I, I, I installed almost electri electricity lights throughout the whole community. Okay. Over 1,200 street lights. And this was through government lobbying or through your personal no, budgets? No, no. I was, it, a thousand of it was my own personal. Okay. Uh, 400 was government uh, supplied to us in Parliament, but the, the thousand that I installed that took a chunk of the community. Uh, almost every community that has electricity got a street light. So you were doing your work in the I was just doing my work. Then Supreme Court appeared in the picture. Yeah, you see, when the High Court issue came up, then after the, they ruled. Uh, we put a stay of execution on it. So it, it was suspended everything. And I was still functioning. Until last year, I would say April. Last year being 2022. 2022. When Supreme Court gave a ruling that I should not be uh, holding myself as a member of power. How did you feel that day when the judgments, when the gavel landed on that decision that you... You are not supposed to be it's, acting. You know, uh, I was, I was, I was surprised because you see the apex court. In my basic knowledge in law and uh, legal proceedings, is they always reserve the final decisions or decisions that are not appealing to you. Go there for review and get clearance. But here's a situation that a matter has not even completed in appeals court, and then they're going. This, the very same interpretation that we're seeking for Article 92A for it is where, which they rejected on my lawyer's side is what the other side brought and then they upheld it and said, okay, now don't hold yourself as a member of parliament until this matter is, is finished. So now, how do my people get representation? During that period, I ran into you in, in parliament. I saw your own job 600. Mm -hmm. It's almost as if at the time the chamber was a no-go area for you. Absolutely. So how are you working? Well, I, was just, I was just doing my normal uh, administrative duties. Uh, but you can't enter the chamber? No, no because uh, I, I, uh, I was uh, under the... You see, this was not a rule of law. You didn't think it was a rule so of totally, law? Totally, totally. Didn't, as I said, uh, the Supreme Court should not be uh, directing the affairs of court proceedings until it comes to the... Uh, level where we need clearance or we need confirmation of certain things. But here we are. We have an injunct uh, state of execution on a matter. It's going through the appeals. Appeals has not even exhausted its time. 
And then suddenly the Supreme Court jumps in and says, don't do the, the we, are, we are passing a ruling. Uh, you see, this was during a time where we were having major issues with uh, the e-levy. I remember very well I was uh, someone to call that day when e-levy was tabled. That was the time from that moment is when I couldn't go. And, the ruling and, and you think it was supposed to save the e-levy? Yes. You because see, because the I, I, in the opposition, minority group position was that uh, we are not in favor of it. And this was something that the executive felt is strongly that it would save their, affairs, their own affairs of running uh, their finances. Obviously, we've all come to bear that this, this didn't work. But all the same, that was, at the time, they felt this way. They were projecting some numbers, as you know, six point something billion. And so then they had myself in court that day, and so my people then decided to walk out because then you know, they, it wasn't balanced, right? You can never get them in, majority of them in the yeah. house mm. because some are ministers, some are on a state, state uh, sponsor. But, but, but it didn't end there. Eventually, you were told that your name ought to be removed and that your, your voting, your election, your swearing in, everything you've done in the chamber in the past should be expunged. Yeah. Well, I think that was the latter part. Yeah. Yeah. The first, the, the ruling they had to restrict me was in April 2022. Now, what you're talking about now was just about two months ago. Yeah. In May. That then they came up with their final ruling that I should not be, uh, have been pronounced as a member of parliament in the first place. Yeah. So, I, you know, it got to a point where I realized, you know, I've always believed in rule of law. I mean, I, I trusted that this is going to be... You see, the difference, I'm even surprised till this date that a Supreme Court of a nation cannot even identify the difference between citizenship and allegiance. See, this matter is about allegiance, you know. It's not about citizenship. Explain the difference. The difference is you, you see, the allegiance, you owe allegiance to another country. This, this is foundation. The allegiance came about during the colonial time when the Brits annexed a lot of, the British annexed a lot of our colon, these colonies. If you recall, some of our great grandfathers even fought in the Second World War. They were not British subjects, you know. But Gold Coast at the time hold allegiance to Britain. And they did that for that purpose, to protect themselves. Because they know they didn't have the numbers. That time there was a scramble for nations. They didn't have the numbers to go fight their wars. So they, that is why at that time, a Ghanaian or Gold Coast at the time, Nigerians could go to Britain without even a visa. But in your case... But they were not citizens of Britain. You see what I'm saying? So, so, so I'm trying to get yours. You, you were a citizen as of the day you filed yes. in Canada. Yes. You were a citizen of Canada as of the day you filed here to contest. Yes. So your point is that even though you were a citizen, you didn't owe allegiance to Canada? No, you swore an allegiance. Okay. And you had unsworn it? And you, you unsworn, and as soon as you submit that application, you have unsworn that allegiance. So for you... So you, the certificate was just a, a form of a confirmation to say that I don't have nothing to do with this. But otherwise, that should not be the subject of... So for you, you were a citizen all right, legally speaking. Yes. But in terms of allegiance, you did not. You did not. It was Ghana. Yes. You argued that point out in the Supreme Court and you lost. But you still think that it was, it was a point that should have been considered? Yeah, they should have. They should, they, I'm sure that somebody, they can't all, be, all of them be naive about it. They should, somebody should know about that. But regardless, we've gone past that stage. I realized then at the time that it's a waste of time for me to fight us. Uh, in court. In court. That's when you issued a statement and said you had left the matter, you've moved out of the court. Yes, and I leave it to the conscience of the people. Right, because it sounded as if you had given up, thrown your hands in despair, you had given up. You just pack bag and baggage and go back to Canada. But no, that no. was not too happy. That was not, no. I, I didn't come because of uh, uh, what, what the court's decisions were. I came because of my people. 
right? And I still have the support of my people. I came for a sin not. At the time that you were going through this period, and I'm sure it must have been stressful and frustrating, did you not ask yourself, well, Mara, I've asked myself that many times. That why am I doing this? But the response I get back is, if you don't do it, who's going to do it? Right? And I, and I may not be too uh, extremely religious, but this process has really strengthened me you know, religiously, that our Creator will never give you anything, any tax that will go beyond you. He will always make sure you can handle it. There were times when I questioned myself and I saw, so I, I, I came to a point I said, now I understand why people like Mandela and them survived 27 years in detention. Some people, I mean, he wasn't a street person, mind you, when Mandela was captured and put into jail. He wasn't a street person. He was a leader of a huge was, political yeah. party. You know, I use the word street person because he had been, maybe would have been toughened a bit, mm. you know, street life. Someone who had his family had, you know. He was, had, had comfort. He had comfort. But, he was able to stay in jail for 27 years. I asked one time I was reading about his and I said, well, how did he survive? Because he could, have, he could have died or whatever within even six months from the transition of where he was and where he is now cracking rocks and all that. So I begin to also relate to myself and I said, why am I doing this? I've worked hard. I have investments in Canada, I have investments here. I could be living in the comfort of my life. Yeah, exactly. Take, so take vacations, go holidays here. When chill. Then, yeah. But then... You have grandkids? Yeah. You have grandchildren? Of How course. many? Four. Okay. So then I begin to ask myself, why am I, why am I doing all this? It says, if you don't do it, who's going to do it? And I see this is more even fulfilling in my life than all what I've done in the rest of my life, in the past. Because if I, when I go to a synod and I see the amount of youth, women, aged people, men looking up to you, when people are calling you biblical names like Moses, this is our Moses, this is our this, it our Messiah. You. So you see, you cannot retreat. It's no longer about me. This, this, this push is no longer about me. It was me. bigger than you. Bigger than That's me. So, so did you feel you were pushed into the by-election or you didn't have a choice? Okay, did you not, did you not have a choice to withdraw? Because I've seen, I've seen and heard publications that you had wanted not to run for the by-election. That's not And true. that the NDC hierarchy sat you down and said, no. you are the only one who can win that seat for no, us. No, you have no, to go. No, 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 no. Anybody says that, I think it's just a makeup. Never crossed my mind. Had a meeting one time. When that April, back in April last year, when they put that restriction on me, I was asked by the party if that question ever came up, if I if I want to go for by-election, and when do I want to go for by-election? I told them straight up. I said they can do it tomorrow. They can do it six months. They can do it one year. I'm going to win. Win he did. This is face to face on City TV. James Chachikwese is my guest. He's MP for Asin North. He's won the by election. The second coming of Chachikwese is what we're going to talk about when we come back on this story of his that we are unfolding on face to face. Please stay with us. City TV is live. On DSTV, find us on channel 363. On GoTV, we're on channel 117. And on HD+, get us on channel 108. On a digital TV, run a new search. But take note that without an antenna, you cannot access City TV. City TV can be accessed on any free-to-air digital box like the GoTV and HD+, boxes. City TV, it's your world.
Yeah, welcome okay, back. This is face to face. My guest is the member of parliament for Asin North, James Yachi Kwesin. You went for the by election. We heard that there was a lot of inducement of the voters. You played your part, didn't you? You also gave money. Money? Hmm. Myself? Yeah. No. You didn't give money? I never gave money for votes. How about sewing machines, fridges, yeah. television sets, anything? No. We are. Uh... If I, if I gave anything, it was something. All the items that were logistics that were geared towards the uh, needs of the people. I, I gave out machetes for their farms. I gave out weedy sites. Uh, you were inducing them. You were you have buying their votes. You, I don't call that votes. These are, these are items I wish I could get for them. In fact, uh, the government at the right time itself who is at the time not seeking for votes will give items such as that to farmers. If you get a farmer, well, it's, it may be the timing. Yeah, so the timing if is... If the timing is when you thought, uh, you, you're talking about, I don't even think that... It is something I've, we've put... In fact, as late as last week, we got some Wellington boots, some we decided from the government, from a common fund administrator. And you went to distribute? And I went to, I just came back yesterday. But during the period that you were going for the by-election, anything you give to the people was interpreted to mean you were buying their votes. You accused the government of doing that. You yeah. even sang for them, for form. you said they were distributing 200 city notes and all of that. You were guilty of your own no, no, accusations. No, no, no. I wouldn't say, uh, you see, we have to uh, explain the process and how certain things happen. Consider a member of parliament who has been restricted for over a year, uh, 14 months to be precise, until the time of the by-election, April 2022 until June 2023. My engagement with them could even be perceived as, you know, uh, breaching the law. Don't carry yourself as a member of parliament. And suddenly, the opportunity is now open. There's a by-election coming on. I've taken a nomination. I'm going to run. Like every other campaign, the people had already expressed some of the things they need. I will never give them what they don't need. I had a list of communities that needed boreholes. A list of communities that needed uh, community centers, list of communities that all items they needed. So I focused on those lists for the past 14 months, which I couldn't do. And I said, here is my list. This is what I can do for the people. So you started delivering that. Now that you're back to the chamber, does it feel awkward or how, how are you feeling now that you've, you've returned? No, it's not awkward. It's, I belong, I've, I'm back to where I suppose I belong in how, the first how, place. How is the feeling like having gone and won the victory at the polls, despite the pendency of the court cases and all of the issues? You mean uh, in terms of how, how, relationships? Your, yeah, yeah, no, what's your feeling? I mean, how, how do you feel that you were, you were hounded out of the chamber, you've gone and the people have voted for you to come back? Um, I don't. I don't see it as. A, of course, it's a, it was a setback. But I'm also happy to know that I've come back to do the work I can do for the people. You weren't afraid that you would lose the by-election. No. Before the by-election and even after. The attorney general decided that you are going to be in court every day. Yeah. What's your view on that? The well, daily I mean, trial. I think the daily trial. This, and the court affirmed it. This came up uh, during the uh, campaign because uh, I, the way I read into it is to find ways and means to probably restrict me from yeah, holding on to my campaign and you know gaining the grounds for a possible or uh, a win. So the best they could do, you see, it, it has even reaffirmed also that all along I never believed that the government can be involved with the courts. But now you do. 
Now I'm convinced that an AG can just walk into the court and request that this trial be. Before we're going weekly or at the most, at the earliest, mostly two weeks, and suddenly come every day. In fact, I, I was on campaign trail. And you know what? I came from my constituent to court. That time the court was, uh, if I recall, was 10 a.m. We finished. No, actually it was 12. With 12 to 2. We finished. And by 4.30, I'm in my constituent. I'll campaign till about 11 p.m. That's what you did before the election? I did from the time they were summoning me to come on a daily basis. I did that consistently. And even now that you're back to the chamber, you're having to still do the daily trial. And your colleagues have said that they're going to keep following you. Yeah. Well, they call the daily trial. No, the daily trial is not something that is taking place right now. I mean, it's happening. No, happened. because you're on recess. Yeah. No, but no, if you were no, not. No, no. Even okay. the last time, the last time, I see I have to give a bit of credit to the trial judge now. Okay. Uh, even the last time we went, uh, it was adjourned for, I think, eight days later. You know, I think uh, that's why I'm saying. But uh, do you during foresee the, during the during the uh, elections, that 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 pressure of the daily thing was there, but obviously it didn't work. Mm. I even made a joke and said they can give me a chamber in the court, and I'll sleep there and still win the seat. I didn't have to be on the ground, you know. There's a bigger issue that faces you now. Yeah. Aside the legal civil cases against you, mm -hmm. there's a criminal case, a possibility of you going to jail because you committed what the Attorney General believes to be perjury, that you have lied on oath. You're having a criminal case against you now. You're a grandfather, a father, a husband, and all of that. You're not scared that you would end up in Insawam? No. Why should I? Why I should mean, I? Mean? You know, I believe in a justice system. I'm sure uh, I cannot comment too much on the details of the case. But I, all I know is that you see, the fundamental issue about any judicial matter is does that person intended to commit the crime? Did he plan it? I have not planned anything of such. How can a person who holds a dual citizenship, right? You know, you get dual citizenship through Ministry of Interior where you have to present your two passports, your Ghanaian passport, your Canadian passport, and then they give you a green certificate, which is your dual city. So from 2009 till the time I became just solely Ghanaian, I was traveling from Canada to Ghana without a visa, which means the Ghanaian authorities even recognizes me as a dual citizen person. So how can that same person be applying or renewing their passport and say, I don't have any other nationality? That doesn't make sense. Unless they also don't check their own records. You should have a file there before you apply for dual citizenship. They make copies of your Ghanaian passport, copies of your Canadian. You have to have two passports. Otherwise, you can't apply for dual citizenship. And then they give you a certificate. So when I'm traveling from here to Canada, I put that certificate in any of the passport. You don't need a visa from here to go. When I'm coming from there, I put the same certificate on it. Because mind you, citizens of Ghana, uh, Canada, coming to Ghana requires visas. But you don't. James Grayson never required visa from 2009. So you don't fear Not you go all. to jail? Not at all. No. You're sure you'd come no, up no, with the right? No, no, I, I, you know, what I'm, my strongest conviction is that this is just a matter of time. And that, uh, see, when you believe you've done the right thing, you shouldn't be afraid. You trust the court to return a positive verdict for Very you? much positive. You trust your lawyers? I trust my lawyers. I trust the conscience of the people. Will you run again for Asin North in the future? Well, if they ask me to run, of course I will. But for now, you're going to do your work as a member of parliament? I'm a member of parliament. For I'm very proud to be the first gentleman of ASEAN North. And I'm going to uh, work for my people based on all the 
the, 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 the vision I have and also the faith they have in me. I'm going to deliver to them. Honorable James Judge Quisin, Member of Parliament, I not. Thank you for joining us on Face to Face. I thank you and I thank my family for giving me all the support. I thank the people of Asin North, and in fact, I thank all my well wishes. Even some MPP people who have come personally to me to wish me well, I thank them. Because this is about the country, it is not about me. Well, that will be for Face to Face on City TV. My name is Umaru Sandamado. Thank you for watching.